Mr. Mayor, thank you um, for flying 10,000 miles to be interrogated. My pleasure. Uh, you, well, we'll see. Um, <laughs> the, um, let me just set the stage very, very quickly, if I can. Um, you know, I, the over, this is the overarching question that, that comes to me when I'm thinking about you and your job. Um, stipulated that every mayor in this room has 99 problems, right? Um, you're the only mayor I can think of um, who governs a city where the end of the world could take place. In other words, you have the, the, the act of a single religious fanatic of any faith could trigger a regional conflagration, something even, even worse. It's also, you're the mayor of a city that is yearned for by hundreds of millions or billions of people who literally believe that the Messiah will appear or, or reappear, depending on your theological proclivity, uh, in your city. Um, your city is also understood generally to be the, 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 the road through which peace has to come, the road on which peace will come. In other words, uh, the Palestinians say a sine qua non for peace in the Middle East uh, is a capital in the eastern half of the city you now govern. So with all of these issues, theological, cosmological, political, geopolitical, I'm wondering, you know, listening to all these, this talk this morning of Airbnb and, and 311 lines and various improvements, I'm wondering if there's any technocratic fix or fixes to your city that would overcome some of the existential dilemmas that you face. And I know that you're a technocrat, and I wanted to hear your response to the idea that there's something that a mayor can do to actually ameliorate Jerusalem's crisis. That's an interesting introduction, I have to admit. Uh, you know, I come from the high-tech world. I'm a high-tech entrepreneur. And you were just focusing on some of the challenges and the downsides we have in the city. Let me take you a second uh, to my vision and the upside, the huge upside Jerusalem has. You're talking about one of the most important brands in the world, 3,000 years of investment. Uh, people in the high-tech sector probably appreciate that. Four billion people around the world would like to come to Jerusalem at least once in their lifetime. And the role Jerusalem played in the past and plays into the future as a united city that unites people, that focuses on the common denominator, in spite of all the conflict you could think of that we have big time in our city, there's a huge upside in Jerusalem. And I'm there to exploit it. Um, you have to understand that 3,000 years ago, Jerusalem was a city that was never divided to tribes. It, it, was, it belonged to all tribes. And Jews and non-Jews alike used to come to Jerusalem, enjoy seeing other people, respect each other, a thousand years, Jerusalem was and probably is still the center of all people of all faiths. Now, when you compare, and I've done some comparables between Jerusalem and other major cities in the world, and you find that uh, if New York has over 50 million tourists a year and Rome has over 40, we had, when we did the research with Professor Michael Porter from Harvard Business School, just a little bit over 2 million tourists a year. So relative to our potential, that's minor. So I am focusing, and there's a reason I'm starting with this point, I'm focusing on the huge upside Jerusalem has. And when you do that, well, guess what? All residents understand that there's an upside there, and when we start pushing aggressively, pursuing culture and tourism, uh, and improving uh, our economy, which uh, our budget's been growing over 10% five years in a row, you see the economy pick up, it creates very, uh, a sense of sort of quiet and, um, and, and much, much easier to manage the city and resolve issues that we've heard that all mayors have. Okay, so tourism represents the messianic age for you in a way, but let me just deal with a couple of the hard realities that you have to deal with right now. 37% of your population is Arab. Mm -hmm. They have the right to vote, but they've been boycotting participation, participation in government for as long as you and I can remember. Um, the spending levels on the east side, which is mainly Arab, are incomparable to what's going on on the west side. You have well, let's go right to this question of the peace process, because you're sitting at the epicenter of it. You agree with me that, that the Palestinians argue that they say, we're not going to have peace without a capital in East Jerusalem. You say they're not going to have a capital in East Jerusalem. Is that a correct? Indeed. So what does that mean for the peace process? Well, it depends how you want to, again, what, what your vision is. Um, not Jerusalem by ideology. By ideology, it was never divided. And practically, I, I was a venture capitalist. 
there's no comparable, a successful comparable of a city that was split, that ever functioned and worked. Um, not even one. They either stay, um, as Jerusalem was from 48 to 67, a split, difficult city to manage where rights, human rights are not uh, absorbed wisely and well, um, or they get reunited again. So why are you taking us to a route that there's, the chances of success is zero? As a matter of fact... Are you saying that there is zero chance that zero you can have chance, a Palestinian state with a capital in East Jerusalem? Yes, I, I believe so. And God forbid, if God forbid it happens, it's going to make things worse, not better. But what, you always frame this as a question of dividing the city. Why not sharing the city? Well, that's what we're doing today. But you're not sharing <laughs> it with the Palestinians. Well, of course, any resident... Look, there's only one democracy in the Middle East. That's Israel. There's only one country, and in Jerusalem, as, as, a, as an example, okay that you have uh, total women's right to do anything you want. There's minority rights. Uh, to, there's total freedom of religion. Anyone could go to any mosque that is managed by the Muslims, to any church that is managed by the Christians, or synagogue managed by the Jews. There's total respect. As a matter of fact, there's only one restriction in Jerusalem, and that's Jews that are not allowed to pray on Temple Mount. That's the only limit, limit, limitation by police, enforced by the police. So within that total openness, and uh, you have been to our city, and I assume that many people in the crowd here have been into Jerusalem in the last uh, five, seven years. By the way, who has been into Jerusalem to f in the last five years? Yeah. So people that have, have been to Jerusalem understand that today it's an international open city. No other city in the Middle East, no other capital in the Middle East is so open. Um, and so I beg to uh, differ from uh, people saying that the city has to be shared. It's shared today. And it's governed today in a way that is open. I received the city with gaps. By the way, not only with the Arab uh, uh, neighborhoods, but also with Jewish neighborhoods. Uh, unfortunately, I received a city that is one of the, the poorest in the country. And when you build our economy in culture and tourism, and tourism is now up, we're at a run rate. Um, over four million tourists a year. We've doubled tourism in the last seven years. Uh, everyone enjoys it. When it rains, it rains on everyone. The employees in the uh, hotel business, in the restaurants. Today is a very, very vibrant, open, dynamic city. Uh, and when I hear our peer mayors discussing about how to take their cities into the future, I share the same values, I share the same uh, challenges we have. We're also dealing with our 311 system. What are you specifically doing to bring the Arabs into the political system? Given that you don't want to have a separate yeah. state, what are you going to do to bring them into the political system? Well, we have something that compensates the, to the fact that they've never been uh, uh, practically voting, uh, and that is our community councils. W what I've introduced is uh, um, we are now managing Jerusalem as seven boroughs. Each borough, uh, on, we have on average about four uh, neighborhoods that are defined geographically, demographically, so that it's easier to serve the residents. In each one of these uh, uh, community councils, there are um, local leadership that is defined as leaders of the uh, neighborhood, and they help us align their st tactical uh, uh, needs with the municipal service so that we tailor the, prior uh, the prioritization done by the municipality is aligned with the local leadership of the different neighborhoods. It's done exactly the same in ultra-Orthodox neighborhoods, in secular neighborhoods, in Arab neighborhoods. It's the same methodology. And by the way, we get to similar results. They, guess what? Everyone wants better jobs, better education, better quality of life. All residents, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, the same. President Obama and a lot of Israeli officials say that the status quo is unsustainable. You disagree? Well, look at the Middle East. What, uh, what status quo are you talking about? All countries around Israel are falling apart. Look what's happening in Syria, Lebanon. We had the crisis, and hopefully they'll, you know, they're out of it in, in Egypt. Um, Jordan is not simple for, for the king to manage. Iraq, Iran. And then, with all that turmoil of the Middle East, you have an island of sanity called Israel, which is a democracy that shares exactly the same values and interests as the United States and m majority of the modern uh, Western world, okay? And within that, our economy's booming. Everyone's enjoying uh, the growth of the economy. Mm -hmm. It's true that we have gaps that we have to close. I hear that it's not 
the only city in the world that has some challenges. You just I heard I the last session. Yeah. yeah. And, and so we have our challenges. And I am the mayor of all residents of the city of Jerusalem. They're all my children. We have to take care of all of them, regardless of their religion. Well, come to this for a second, because you, while you travel freely or semi-freely through most of the neighborhoods of Jerusalem, um, I lived in Jerusalem. I spent a lot of time in Jerusalem. I know that, it, in, in fact, it is two different cities. For most, most Jews don't go to the Arab neighborhoods. Most Arabs don't go to the Jewish neighborhoods. There are exceptions, and obviously in moments of peace and tranquility, or more peace and more tranquility, you have that. But what can you do specifically to, to, to bring those communities together? Or is that even, maybe we're talking too much in an American context. Maybe the goal is amicable, amicable divorce and not reuniting these communities or making them live together. Well, the reality is, uh, is, is a little bit different. Uh, let me share with you some of the facts. We have um, a Formula One roadshow. We had last year, we're going to have in two weeks' time. When you see the people watching the Formula One cars drive in, inside the city, you see Arabs, uh, you see ultra-Orthodox, uh, secular people, natural religious, all share the streets together and having fun and enjoying uh, motor cars. Um, when you see shows in the, in, in the streets of the city of Jerusalem, you see all people, it's all open uh, for people to well, enjoy. Why don't you talk for a minute about the light rail, which is one of the great innovations. Yeah, one second, Jerusalem. with your yeah, permission. Yeah, but go to that. So it's true, I assume that here in Los Angeles, not every resident goes to all neighborhoods just to see neighborhoods. People go to the center of the city, to the centers, and that's where you go to our centers, to our malls, to our hospitals, to our work, labor force, to our workplaces, to our hotels. You see all sectors sharing jobs, sharing uh, quality of life, sharing same public transport. So it's true that uh, I assume that uh, even in New York, you don't go to all the quarters because you live there. You go from your, where you want to enjoy life and you go to work, and that's exactly what's happening in Jerusalem. You, eventually, you find that ultra-Orthodox people prefer to live next to people similar to them. So do Muslims. Muslims prefer to sit and, and, and live in a, in a neighborhood with people similar to them. And so do the Zionists. But there are exceptions. You find more Arabs living in Jewish predominant neighborhoods than Jews living in predominant Arab neighborhoods. Uh, so there is a total freedom by law uh, for people to live anywhere they want to rent anywhere, anywhere they want, and to work anywhere they want. And if, God forbid, one of the businesses or somebody um, flaws and doesn't work according to the law, there are Israeli courts that uh, will set law and order. Talk about the light rail, though, because yeah. the light rail both encapsulates the promise of a united Jerusalem in that it runs through Arab neighborhoods, through Jewish neighborhoods. Jews use it, Arabs use it. They sit next to each other on the train. In the American context, that doesn't sound like a great big deal. In the Middle East, it's a big deal. Uh, but on the other hand, this summer, which was a bad summer for Jerusalem, bad summer for Israel and Gaza and the West Bank, obviously, um, you had and you still have uh, riots, disturbances where rocks are being thrown at these trains. Jewish ridership is, is way down. Um, and I come back to this vision that you have, and it's a noble vision of having a, a tourism boom in the city. You're not going to have a tourism boom. I mean, hotel occupancy was down 75% over the summer because of the conflict in Gaza. You're not going to have a tourism boom if you have the, the trains, the light rail system being, being stoned. So, I mean, how do you deal with that in a way that respects the, the, the rights of Arabs to protest what they want to protest while protecting civil discourse and, 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 life, and peaceful life in the city? Well, again, a bit of facts. Uh, we're a democracy. Anybody could dem can demonstrate as much as he wants according to the law, of course, and uh, people do demonstrate. That's one thing. The other thing is taking the law into your hands. When people start throwing rocks, that is danger, and the police will arrest and does arrest people that uh, take the law into their hands. Uh, we had an unfortunate uh, series of, uh, we had an unfortunate murder of an Arab uh, Jerusalemite, uh, Abu Khdir, um, which created, uh, you know, lots of tensions and, uh, and disorder in the city and was uh, initially uh, um, isolated by the police and then the police went after all the people that demonstrated and they're going to go to court and whatever court decides, they'll get punished. But you better, you have to understand the facts. The majority of the Arab population understands that it's not good for them either. Uh, it hurts the economy, um, the, you go to the old city, it hurts their businesses. The majority of the Arab uh, leadership in Jerusalem and the public 
doesn't like uh, what has happened in the summer. Um, it, it doesn't serve any of their interests. The majority of the Arab residents of Jerusalem do not want the city divided. So it's against How do our you own interests. We, we poll. You, you poll on that sure. question? Yeah, and you can see independent polls uh, of the Washington Institute and others. And why won't they participate in politics? They have other reasons. They thought, from the unity of the city in 1967, they've never done that. And I assume that throughout the years, hopefully they will. It's in our best interest that they will, because when they get more representation, it's easier to serve. Today, we have to compensate in many ways to serve them. But there's not, when I run the council of 31 council members, and we increase our investments in the Arab neighborhoods of Jerusalem, both in absolute and relative numbers, it passes with no, uh, uh, with no friction. But you recently had a problem, and now this is a question, you, this is from right-wing criticism of you. You recently had to fire one of your coalition members for protesting your decision to allow the building of 2,200 apartments in an Arab neighborhood. Yes. Talk about that for one second and, and, and frame it out in terms of ex exactly what you're doing to try to enfranchise the Arab population, because that, of course, is the criticism from the left that you're not doing enough. Well, um, as I said earlier, I'm committed to serve all constituencies. And to serve means to better plan uh, and to rather than to uh, think of stopping building, which is ridiculous, uh, you have to propose a legal way for people to build and construct. Uh, by the way, if we don't rezone some of the areas in Jerusalem, we ourselves as municipality cannot build the roads and um, it's practical per, uh, practice that every mayor does. Um, now we have a big challenge because uh, in some of the Arab neighborhoods of East Jerusalem, uh, Law and order is not strictly uh, uh, being obeyed. Uh, and some of the faults is a lack of planning. So we deal with many layers of improving quality of life. First is the, plan, the layer of planning. Um, and so we, are, we just finished uh, rezoning and planning uh, southern uh, east side of Jerusalem, which is uh, the uh, neighborhood of Arab Sawahre, uh, 2,500 uh, uh, apartments potential. Um, and it was not easy for some of the members of the uh, coalition, and I had to uh, uh, fire one of the members that, uh, you know, did some extreme moves on this point. Well, I would just stay on and that. By the way, yeah. so when we plan well, good news usually doesn't travel. Only bad news travels, especially in a city like Jerusalem, which has a huge magnifying glass on top of our head. Not only God looks at us, well, but the whole world does. Why, why don't you end with, end with God, if you will? Um, before lunch, um, end on this question because you know, I, I frame this out, and this is the way I've always thought about the problem: as the, the downsides are, are are enormous in Jerusalem, you, because you can a single incident can get magnified and and cause and cause incredible violence. Yep. Um, on the upside, Jerusalem does stand for peace for the three monotheistic religions. And, I mean, this is maybe too much of a burden to put on a mayor, um, even a, a mayor who people believe, I know you'll deny it, believe has national aspirations in Israeli politics. But how do you, how, what, what do you do to, to turn that negative energy, uh, the competition among the monotheistic faiths, and turn that into something positive and peaceful? I mean, I know that's beyond the can of the usual, I got to prevent water main breaks, and I got to deal with traffic, and I got to do all this. But, but, but what's your vision when you leave office? What's your vision for the way Jerusalem will be understood? You got to stick to the vision. You got to stick to uh, the role of the city of Jerusalem, the way it was 3,000 years ago. That's for thousands of years forward. So that's not going to change. There weren't traffic problems then, for instance. Well, that's why we have light rail and new... Uh, new uh, well, well, don't worry about that. That's another <laughs> session. Um, but I think that the focus on the model, this, the strategy of having the city, a united city, where all residents will and do, do improve their quality of life. There's no, there's no other model. And when there's some bumps on the road, like uh, unfortunate this summer that we had a round of violence in the south and... Uh, spilled over to some, uh, including a little bit to Jerusalem, then you manage the situation and as fast as possible go to the striving elements of the city and focus on the upside. Um, and uh, we know how to deal with the downside, but we don't focus on it. We know how to decrease the tension and move as fast as possible to a normality, which is exactly where our city is today. And when you, um, now it's the holiday season uh, in Jerusalem, and you'll find hundreds of thousands, millions of people come to our city. Last year when we had the Ramadan, we had over a million people come, Arabs from all over, not only the country, uh, from all over the Middle East. As long as they come peacefully, 
they slide into the model and everything works great. Uh, when we have more and more people, more and more tourists come and go back as ambassadors of peace of our city, they see its vibrance. They see our uh, uh, marathon. We had 26,000 runners last year. We're probably going to exceed 30,000 runners next year uh, in March. Um, and you have the Light Festival and other um, major investments in our city. And all of a sudden, you see the city lifted to, to its potential. And I think that uh, when you understand that the upside is increasing, in spite of some of the challenges we have every once in a while, the value, the experience, the wow experience coming to Jerusalem is what I'm focused on. Uh, Mr. Mayor, unfortunately, we're out of time. Let me just say that I think that regardless of people's politics, um, the peace in Jerusalem is in the world's interest, and, uh, and we wish you well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.